The pandemic entrepreneurial boom we've been talking about is still happening, but we have a bit of nuance about what has to happen next today on Culture Builder Live. I'm Chris Wink. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Technically, the news organization with a community of technologists and entrepreneurs. It's Culture Builder Live, conversations on building better companies. Today, we're looking at uh, the ecosystems of entrepreneurship, which we so often do. And to do that, I'm joined by Dr. Lomax Campbell. He's the founder of Third Eye Network and has done some interesting work in Rochester, New York. We're going to dive into his work. But first, Dr. Campbell, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Chris. I'm so excited for this conversation today. Yeah, I am too. I am pretty jazzed. So, so in our pre-chat, you enlightened me to something that you've found and identified in this giant entrepreneurial boom we're having during this pandemic. Unusually high rates of business and corporation. It's still throwing us. It's still happening. When you look at how ecosystems have to support their entrepreneurs, what nuance are we still missing about what has to happen now that we are having a momentary boom? Sure, sure. And I appreciate that specific question because oftentimes there's not a lot of spaces to go deep into this. Mm. Um, as a social scientist, doctor of management, strategist that studies niche market segments, I've come to realize that we often don't go deep enough. As I mentioned in our pre-call or pre-interview, I mentioned a lot of times efforts are a mile wide and an inch deep. And so part of my work um, now across the country uh, with about 40 cities is getting folks to think differently about entrepreneurship. Specifically, historically, we've taken universal approaches to supporting entrepreneurs at the different stages of development or just in general. And so it's not uncommon that, you know, a business development capacity building training program runs 10 to 12, 15 weeks, and you will have seasoned business owners in the room with new business owners in the room with people who are still thinking about starting a business in the room. And oftentimes someone's dissatisfied. Mm. Because the curriculum don't speak to and can't speak to all audiences needs because they're at different stages of life. Um, when I worked in city government, one thing I heard from my colleagues in business development, and I ran the mayor's office of community wealth building focused on generational wealth building for diverse audiences. In Rochester, New York, which we're going to touch in on. In Rochester, now. New York. Um, one thing that you always heard was if you wanted funding from someone, it was all about the business plan. And if you were going to start a business, all that mattered was the business plan. And for 20 years, I've been in and out of businesses. Third Eye Network is now my sixth or seventh business. And I've never operated off of a business plan. Mm. It was, it's more important for me to have a strategic plan and to know how to write proposals because I'm a government contractor. And I bid on foundation and federal and state and local government contracts. So the business plan isn't relevant for me and I've never had to go for capital. And so just understanding that, who's training people on how to prepare a proposal? Who's training people uh, or who's providing the hands on technical assistance to help people get registered in vendor systems beyond what is a business, what's accounting, what's finance, what's uh, operations, what's a CRM? Because it's, it's like it's business 101 in many cases. It doesn't prepare you to go do it. Mm. So I've been making the case that from startup to scale up to from startup to stay up to scale up to split up. Mm. You need to differentiate the resources that are providing to entrepreneurs, both based on where they are in their trajectory and based on what their goals are. Um, a lot of times you will have um, elected officials um, and other business support leaders say businesses need access to capital to grow. And, and, and this is true, but we don't have a common understanding across the ecosystem of what forms of capital exist. You know, as a government contractor, it's more important for me to have a line of credit um, and a business credit card so that when I'm traveling for a site visit, I can book hotels and flights. I don't need a loan. And for other businesses, um, they may ever they may never know that there's something called contract financing or, you know, um, uh, there, there's different types of uh, loans out there that and, and how they work. So it's important to get that level of depth. Because a lot of times people that run programs don't give the whole story. And so folks would take on organizational structures or take on products, financial products that don't fit their current use case. So, so let me jump in because I, I think what I hear out of that is maybe a, a, a positive spin insofar that we are 15 years in our 
rebounding focus on entrepreneurship after decades of decline. And as we at Daphne reported breathlessly during this pandemic, we were all shocked when we saw business and corporation pop when we were expecting it to decline. It is boomed. Um, and so these conversations have matured a lot around the world, certainly around the country. Cities have developed entrepreneurial ecosystems. There are events and programs at universities and co-working spaces and conversations and limitless online content that can give yeah. you some resources. So I hear you saying it's time to add a bit of nuance to this conversation because Correct. we have lots on the, I want to build a SaaS, SaaS company and raise outside financing and, and go as big and fast as I can. We have some on the, I want to open a, a maybe a, a commercial storefront, but there's a range of other entrepreneurial pathways that aren't as robust. So I hear you saying, We've had a freelancer boom in this pandemic. We've had a business and corporation boom. So we have more people than ever who are holding an LLC or something like it. But right. what do they do next is what I hear you saying we need to start talking right. about. Is that fair? That, that's very fair. And I mentioned, you know, my work was mostly with diverse entrepreneurs and their needs are different. Their experiences are different. And we shouldn't put the, um, I'm going to just say the, the onus on them to just show grit and go out and do um, in order to be successful, because we know that grit alone won't get us out of structural and, his, and historical challenges that we've been facing. So I mentioned to you earlier, um, the uh, Association for Enterprise Opportunity published a report called The Tapestry of Black Business in the United States mm -hmm. back in 2017. So it's a bit dated, but these types of things don't change much in a few years. And they, they indicated in their, in their, their report that 96% of black owned businesses which were estimated to be about 2.56 million across the country. 96% are solopreneurs. And even after five years of operations on average, don't bring in more than $50,000 a year. So when we say we need calls for starting new businesses, because that's the pathway to wealth and sustainable growth and, and affluence. But then you look at the data that says, most of them don't make more than $50,000 a year, even after five years, you have to ask, are we doing ourselves a disservice or is this morally wrong? The 4% that become employer firms on average, uh, be they black male or black female, um, after about five years tend to do between 775,000 um, per year and about 1.4 million. And so the secret sauce is getting small businesses to hire at least one person. Mm. Um, or if they already hire two or three, helping them get to 10 if it makes sense for their business. They don't have to become high scale where they have 100 employees or become, you know, a major corporation. But firms with five to 10 employees can do very well and put other infrastructure in place beyond salaries like retirement programs, life em like employee life insurance programs that would allow the employees and the owners to begin to get a piece of the American dream. Mm. I so regret that we were chatting in the green room uh, a little longer than expected because you and I have so, so much in common. So we will be talking again soon, Dr. Campbell, but I'd love to um, get like a, just a couple minutes of window into some of your work in Rochester, New York still remains a challenged place. Cause turns out there's nowhere in the world that doesn't have its challenges. But I, sure. I wonder if you could um, share, like, is there, is there a, an example out of your work in Rochester, New York, that other cities that are, you know, are, are will be most interested in? Is there a case study or a number? Like what's your guiding light of this is a thing we did in Rochester that we learned about supporting entrepreneurs, uh, an entrepreneurial ecosystem that should and can be replicated elsewhere? Sure. Um, I would say I'll take a, a counterintuitive approach. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a social scientist. And when I first started with the mayor's office of community wealth building, I was told your first task is to build an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I started learning about what that meant going to the Kauffman Foundation's eShip Summit, um, reading up on papers from people like Dr. Del Gines from the, the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City and different colleagues in government um, at the time, like Nia Richardson out of uh, Kansas City, Missouri, where she runs the KC BizCare office. And I said, you know what? There is no shortage of services and programs and resources, but those in and of themselves are not structural and systemic in nature in terms of the types of change that they're going to advance. I said the fundamental problem here is that there's a lot of duplication of effort. There's a lot of organizations support entrepreneurs, but they do it in silos 
And so there's a there's a dearth of collective impact because it's informal, right? Um, there's no data that allows you to say, if I sent someone to Chris for support, and then you sent them over to me for support, and then I sent them over to another person, there's no way to track how many people were moved between our organizations, what their goals were, and did they achieve them. And so I ended up devising a program funded with state dollars at the time. I called it the Resource Partner Enhancement Program. Hmm. So what that did was that allowed me to invest about $1.5 million dollars in six nonprofit organizations with entrepreneur um, development programs, small business development programs, over two years. Um, I gave each of them, I awarded each of them via RFP $150,000 in grants over two years that they were relatively unrestricted. They were able to hire new staff with it. They were able to do curricular asset building. They were able to subscribe to software, revamp their site, restructure, map processes, things like that. Um, they were able to do racial equity training with that and things of that nature to bring that lens into the work, understanding that a black entrepreneur from Kenya who relocated, who learned, who moved to Rochester may have fundamentally different needs than, say, um, a Spanish speaking um, entrepreneur who's been here two generations um, and socioeconomics come into play as well. And so we said, well, OK. In addition to that, because I don't want to assume that people who run these programs have business degrees, have entrepreneur experience, um, has ever taken out a business loan before, they've never formed a corporate, like if they've never done it, but they're running some canned you know, program that was subscribed to right. wholesale, they need development. They need to be made aware of the breadth of these things. And they're doing something that they've never done before as an organization because they've never had the unrestricted funds to do it. Right. So why don't we add to our model organizational coaching services? And that allowed us to hire six for-profit small business owners, mostly black and brown, um, two women at the time, to be assigned to them and assist them along their enhancement journey over two years. They were going to work independently to advance what they needed to to make their services more culturally and contextually relevant, but also cooperate as a cohort to create a supply chain of support or clusters of support based on targeted entrepreneur goals. That program went so well that um, when the SBA Community Navigator pilot program came out, we were awarded tier three status for another million. Mm. And we added four more organizations and coaches to the cohort, which led to us investing a total of a, a, a million dollars with 10 uh, predominantly black and brown and women owned businesses over two years that would have never had these contracting opportunities. And what I didn't share, Chris, is that um, we influenced the development of that program because the person right. that went off and brought the idea to the White House was one of the recipients in my original program. Mm. Oh, cheers to that. Um, here's what we got to do. Dr. Campbell, you and I will be talking again because there's a ton of overlap here. Um, I'm going to we'll drop links below to both the, the resource enhancement program and, and Dr. Campbell's work. We'll also be recapping this and some other notes. Um, Dr. Campbell, you and I are going to talk again. Thank you for coming and squeezing us in in our in the tight window we had. Thanks so much for being here. Not a problem. Thank you for having me. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Uh, okay. Everyone, we'll see you next time on Culture Builder Live. See ya.